Session today is called When the Deccan Ruled India, the Forgotten World. The history of the vast Indian subcontinent is usually told as a series of ephemeral moments when a large part of modern day India was ruled by a single sovereign. There is an obsession with foreign invasions as the polities of the Gangetic Plains, while the histories of the rest of the subcontinent have been reduced to little more than dry footnotes. Anirudh Kanisetti, in, in conversation with Aditya Ramanathan, shines a light into the darkness, bringing alive for the lay reader the early medieval Deccan from the 6th century common era to the 12th century common era in all its splendor and riotous glory. Uh, the discussion will be punctuated by a few readings uh, by actor Daya Sindhu Sakrepatna. Over to Aditya and Anirudh. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on a, a Thursday evening. Uh, we really do hope that uh, today we will go deep into the early medieval Deccan and far away from the uh, you know noisy traffic outside. Uh, so I just uh, will start by just uh, you know talking about Anirudh. Uh, I've known Anirudh for a few years, and uh, I did for some part of that time get an opportunity to uh, to see Anirudh uh, working on this book, and uh, I, I, I vividly remember. Uh, all the times he'd you know excitedly be pounding at his keyboard writing a chapter or sharing some idea uh, you know his face would brighten every time he thought of something new or he would uh, trace a military campaign on a map uh, and it's really really heartening to see the book coming uh, to fruition and, and and really enjoying the kind of success it is uh, you know uh, when I when I was reading the book uh, I, I was thinking how do you describe this and uh, the the phrase I shared with Anirudh was breathtaking ambition. And uh, the reason I, I think that, that that's really true is, uh, first, Anirudh is, uh, he's covering a large period, uh, like Lata mentioned, something like 500 years. And uh, if you were writing a history of, you know, 500 years of the Deccan, then it'd be, it would be perfectly acceptable to, you know, do a sort of lightweight pop history. Uh, and people would still really like your book. But Anirudh doesn't do that. Uh, he goes further. He, he integrates uh, political, social history uh, with architecture, religion, uh, military history. And he, he, he somehow manages to weave all of this into this coherent uh, and, I, I dare say, page-turning narrative history, uh, which is, is something quite rare. It's also equally rare to find a history like this of the early medieval Deccan. Uh, so I think this is uh, really a standout book, and it's great to have Anirudh here at the stage with me. Uh, so also, like Lata mentioned, we'll have uh, a few excerpts from the book read out, uh, but we'll just get started with the conversation first. Uh, so Anirudh, firstly, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Aditya. Uh, and thank you also to Lekha, to Raghu, to Daya, and for, to the entire team at BIC for doing this, and of course to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many familiar faces as well as new faces in the audience today. And I really hope that we will be giving you an insight into a world that is very often forgotten, as the title implies, but also a world that, to me at least, is utterly fascinating and very integral to understanding how India became India. Thanks, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to ask you why you wrote this book. I assume you wrote this book because you're passionate about it and because you're a history nerd. Uh, so what I want to ask you is, uh, you know, let's get into the Deccan itself. Uh, you know, we are looking, firstly, what is the Deccan? You know, how do you define the def Deccan? Can you tell us what sort of place it is like? Uh, and can you also tell us uh, what really strikes me about uh, the history of this period is that the great dynasties that arise don't arise from some lush, uh, you know, fertile plains somewhere. They actually uh, come up in these uh, really uh, difficult areas, you know, where, where agricultural productivity is low, it's, you know, and so on. So can you also walk us through why that happened and why we saw imperial centers arise in this, what seems like an unlikely place? It's a very interesting question. There's really two ways to think about the Deccan. Um, the first is the easier way. Uh, if you imagine the Indian subcontinent as an ice cream cone, uh, the ice cream is the Gangetic Plains, it's northern India, and the central part of the cone is the Deccan. 
Um, the other way of thinking about it is a little more complex in terms of the geography of this land. Um, just to give you a, a sense of the sheer size of this landmass, um, you're all familiar with Portugal, you're all familiar with Kerala. Uh, did you know that the coastline of Portugal is about the same length as the coastline of Kerala? Um, southern India is absolutely vast and we're all aware that Kerala in comparison to the rest of South India is a relatively small place. Um, so the Deccan as, as a landmass is almost the size of France, if not a little larger. Uh, it extends from um, the Vindhya Mountains or, or the Narmada River in the north all the way down to the area that we are sitting in right now, you know, Bangalore in the South Karnataka region. Uh, it's bounded on one side by the Western Ghats, which stop the flow of the, of the monsoons into this land. Um, so the inland of the Deccan is a very dry kind of area, even though it is uh, irrigated by one of the great river systems of subcontinent. So the Godavari River Valley, um, all of us have heard of the Godavari, how many of us know that uh, the, the Godavari River Valley is actually the third largest river valley in the entire subcontinent. Uh, the only ones larger than it are that of the Ganges and the Indus rivers. Um, so it is simultaneously a land that is dry, that has uh, some areas of agricultural productivity and also a lot of areas that are much more geologically ancient, much more geologically rugged. Um, and very interestingly to me at least, all the great early imperial dynasties of Deccan originate in these relatively rugged areas. Uh, as Aitya said, they don't originate in the lush river valleys as we very often think of civilizations originating. Um, if you look at the Chalukyas, for example, who are the, one of the primary dynasties I talk about in my book, uh, they actually originate in the Malaprabha river valley and specifically in the sandstone cliffs near the Malaprabha river. So they originate in this uh, landscape that's easy to fortify and then they expand from there into the river valleys. Uh, the same applies also to the Kadambas uh, who originate in Banavasi in the Western Ghats and then expand into the river valleys. And so also to the Gangas uh, who we might be more familiar with their dynasty that's actually based in Kolar and they actually control uh, Bangalore. Uh, if any of you have been to Nandi Hills, uh, the Gangas call themselves Nandi Girinatha or the Lords of the Nandi Hill. Uh, and the Gangas also, they originate in Kolar, a relatively rocky, dry area, and then they expand to the Belur region, which as you know, is much more fertile. If you actually go there today, you'll see there's a lot of farmland and so on. Um, so to me, that's a very interesting dynamic because we think very often of Indian kingship, Indian polities as originating from abundance and plenty, but the vast amount of the, the, over, over, the overwhelming uh, weight of historical evidence is actually on the fact that kingdoms and polities emerge from hardship and war. And especially in the Deccan, when you're looking at these great Deccan empires, they don't arise from these great aristocratic land-owning families. They originate from what were essentially um, petty warlords who gradually consolidate and establish a fort in a rocky area and then expand into a land of agrarian plenty. And that really is the story of the early Chalukyas. Um, there are some in fact, we're not perfectly sure where the Chalukyas come from. Um, some scholars believe that the name originates from the word Chalke, which means crowbar. Uh, so they may have been agriculturalists uh, who like gradually by fighting battles and by raiding, establish a kingdom of their own. Um, and the way they do it to me also is very interesting, Aditya, because um, they do this by performing the Ashwamedha Yagna as well as a whole bunch of other rituals. And though we have a tendency to think of these rituals as being um, you know, very focused on religious devotion. I think one very important aspect that I highlight in the book a lot is that rituals were very often associated with spectacle. Uh, to perform a royal ritual like the Ashwamedha was a sign of the extraordinary power and resources you commanded. And very often it was also a sign of violence. Uh, I, of course, won't go into details because I want you all to buy the book, obviously. Um, but um, to come from essentially an agricultural background, to rise through raiding and war, to establishing a kingdom and an empire is a pretty drastic change in fortunes. And I would really like to, I'd like all of us to imagine uh, a medieval India that is not static, but rather the one that is full of these constantly rising and falling dynasties who are all forged in the heat of war. Yeah, uh, forged in the heat of, heat, heat of war is absolutely correct. And I mean, what really strikes me is that uh, is how fast, especially the Chalukyas rise, right? Uh, so you, when, by, you know, when you go from Pulukeshin the first to his grandson, uh, suddenly, you know, they've gone from nothing, from maybe agriculturalists to to these powerful monarchs. I mean, and to I, I can't think of a parallel in, in modern times except maybe some of the great business families, and uh, and with that power, you see uh, the ambition itself changing, right? Uh, with Pulukeshin too, he is able to imagine. Uh, his power and uh, how he could wield that power very differently 
uh, from his predecessors. Can you tell us about this man? What do we know about him? And, uh, you know, perhaps what he's best known for is fighting the greatest monarch in India at that time, Harsha. What, how did he find himself in that situation? Um, I really like this parallel of like drawing a, like connecting medieval royalty to modern business families. And I think that's actually, that's actually a much more accurate parallel than we would think. Um, because though we have a tendency today to kind of project um, nationalist ideas of this unity of a particular linguistic group or a particular political group onto the past, the reality of it is that the past was just as full of the same kind of absurd reversals of fortune and this sudden meteoric rise into the upper ranks as we're familiar with today. And along with that, you know, you see, uh, like Aditya said, this total transformation over generations uh, where perhaps today you would see perhaps a small businessman um, whose grandson is now, you know, a billionaire. You would see the same thing with medieval monarchs as well, where you would have somebody who's an agriculturist and whose grandson is suddenly one of the most powerful monarchs in his immediate region. Um, and as a result of that, their identities also change very, very profoundly. Uh, we have to keep in mind that they're living in a world that, as I said, is not static. It is full of cultural churn and political innovation. And these individuals are just as intelligent and just as humane as you or I. Uh, they are governed by the same ability for uh, creativity and innovation and also the same kind of um, deeper and darker impulses towards cruelty and greed and avarice. Um, and I think that really understanding that need, that hunger for uh, glory and imperial expansion um, is a very important lens that we need to apply to understanding medieval India. Um, so, Pulukeshan the first is the first of these Chalukya kings who emerges from historical obscurity to perform these yagnas and declare himself a Maharaja. Um, his grandson, Pulukeshan the second, um, who we are going to meet soon in an excerpt that Lekha is going to read, um, he is born into a family that has only had access to Sanskrit-based knowledge and education for two generations. Um, so you got to imagine what it was like for this for this kid to grow up, right? His his grandfather and grandmother would have spoken to him perhaps in old Kannada or Maharashtri Prakrit, and he is growing up speaking Sanskrit uh, to his courtiers and to his uh, to his administrators. Um, and again, the parallel to today I think is 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 very interesting because I'm sure all of us have grandparents who would have spoken to us only in our mother tongues, while we would speak back to them in English. Um, so Sanskrit was very much the knowledge of uh, of mobility, uh, the language of mobility and the language of knowledge. It was the language in which imperial power and charisma was formulated. It was also the language in which um, you would build an awareness of your wider surroundings. Um, so Pulakeshin begins as, uh, as a boy who's cut out for the throne. Uh, his father is, you know, the eldest son of Pulakeshin the first. Um, he he's expected to have this orderly succession, but then dies quite abruptly. And uh, Pulakeshin's uncle Mangalesha actually seizes the throne. So it's this very Hamlet or Lion King esque kind of narrative that unfolds, uh, where Pulakeshin is forced to flee his uncle's court, um, raises an army by himself, and then goes back and kills his uncle and seizes the throne for himself. And once he does that, um, it seems that, you know, a lot of the people who supported him expected that, you know, you know, he's just a kid, he's going to be in a pocket. Uh, but he shows from the very outset of his career that he is a man who is not to be trifled with. Uh, one of the first acts that he does is to actually attack his rivals, the Kadambas, uh, and sack and possibly destroy the city of Banavasi to a considerable extent, exterminates the Kadamba royal line, uh, and then begins to expand his ambitions. So he's no longer content with merely being a king of the Deccan, but now he wants to expand his power into southern Gujarat. He wants to control trade that's coming to the west coast. Um, and the thing is that Pulikeshan was not the only Indian emperor at the time who wanted a slice of, the, of southern Gujarat. Uh, also interested in that was Harsha. Uh, this much more powerful North Indian emperor who had already managed to dominate parts of Eastern India and now wanted to control the markets of the West as well. Um, so there's this almost this inevitable kind of deeper geopolitical clash that was brewing and Pulakeshin and Harsha uh, basically become the flashpoints of that conflict. Absolutely. Uh, over to you, Lekha. In the lush green foliage of a Deccany winter, dozens of Chalukya elephants must have cleared a path through the moist undergrowth, soon churned into mud by miles of marching soldiers. Thousands of bare feet squelched in the mud 
and trample down the grass and insects. As the sun bathes the Vindhyas, Chalukya scouts, perhaps allied forest tribes, may have fanned through the seemingly endless forests using sounds and drums to signal the approach of the enemy. Harsha's army was probably carefully tracked and avoided until the very last moment. Ambushes and sneak attacks may have been planned to stretch their supply lines and worsen morale. Thickets might conceal ambushers with bows and spears, while hills and ravines might hide elephants to trample incautious groups of infantry. When Harsha's army, like the Mughals centuries later, was disoriented and exhausted in the unfamiliar Deccan, Chalukya forces may have aimed to lure them into a brutal, decisive confrontation. Pulakeshin's troops were ideally adapted to close quarter combat. His elephants, in the hundreds, were fed huge quantities of alcohol before battle. Spikes fitted to their tusks, great bells hung around their necks, howdahs tied to their backs. The animals were then bunched together into close formation of for massed charges. Brave mahouts desperately trying to guide them with the fearsome ankusha, a sharp elephant gourd dug into the eyes, dug into their eyes and temporal glands. To the hypnotic beating of battle drums, the elephants were followed by bands of elite hereditary warriors wearing loincloths and minimal armor, also drunk on alcohol. Harsha's court poet describes his infantry as wearing top knots and spotted red coats, ears adorned with ivory rings. The North Indian emperor commanded them from the back of his elephant, Darpashata, a massive animal whose head was adorned with a crested crown of gold. But beyond this, there is little we know for certain of the confrontation between the two young emperors. Pulakeshin's inscriptions and those of other medieval royals paint pictures of horrifying battlefield violence. They describe elephants colliding, tusks gleaming with blood, the hulking beasts would attempt to force each other to topple, the senses dulled by alcohol as their riders stabbed each other with lances. The screams of men trampled underfoot and gored by tusks, the squeals of fallen elephants whose bellies were pierced by the cruel spears of the Chalukya infantry must have filled the forest. But eventually, perhaps after months or weeks or Perhaps after a few disastrous, disastrous ambushes and confrontations, Harsha seems to have realized that he would have to cut his losses. Forces, forcing the Deccan to accept his suzerainty was not worth sacrificing an entire army. Perhaps he intended to renew the conflict another time, but that time would never come as rebellions and easier pinkings called his attention east and kept him there until the end of his reign. Pullakeshin II, unlikely lord of the Deccan, had defeated the subcontinent superpower. And so, as Harsha ordered his retreat, as the Vindhyas reverberated with the sound of retreating drums and the piercing blast of victory trumpets, Pulakeshin was left to giddily proclaim his astonishing victory. As a Chalukya court poet put it, Emperor Harsha, whose name meant joy, had lost his laughter in the Deccan. All of a sudden, it was clear, not only to Pulakeshin's vassals, not only to his family, but to the entire subcontinent that the Deccan had arrived. As kings and emperors reeled from the news, Pulakeshin claimed the splendid title of Parameshwara, Paramount Lord. Lata and the Northern Deccan were his. 
he now turned his attention to the rest of India, south of the Narmada. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, the guy can write. Um, but yeah, so we actually, uh, you know, as you point out, we, we don't know a whole lot about the details of this campaign, but uh, we do know of its outcome. And we do know that it's clear that the outcome really shaped the future of the, you know, the politics of the early med medieval uh, Deccan. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the end of uh, Harsha's ambitions that do allow uh, Pulukeshin II to not just expand, but also uh, to change the way uh, his dynasty and his ruling family are seen. And uh, you illustrate one of the ways he does this is uh, through architecture. And, uh, you know, we do see this architecture around us today uh, when we go to, say, North Karnataka. Uh, but... You know, I think the mistake that we make is we assume that these are just religious, uh, uh, these are just symbols of religion or they're just re religious structures, but they're not, right? You you do talk about uh, the profound political role uh, they play in uh, shaping perceptions about, for example, the Chalukyas. Can you tell us about uh, uh, how the Chalukyas approached architecture? What were their, uh, what, what drove them? Uh, how do they see it? Uh, and tell us also just about how beautiful it is and how difficult it is to, to make that stuff. Um, as Aditya said, right, we have a tendency to think of temples as structures that are made only out of devotion. Um, but just like the structures that we are used to inhabiting, uh, this auditorium, for example, architecture is a condensed social fact. The way that a building is designed, the way a society conceptualizes and executes its buildings tells you a lot about the way society sees itself. We can conclude, if you were to find an auditorium in the archaeological record, that this is a society that enjoys attending talks by young historians on Thursdays, for example. Um, now, if you look at Chalukya temples, rather than seeing them merely as um, religious structures, which is how we see temples today, if you try to look a little deeper, understand why is it these temples are built in those particular ways, then we can understand a lot about how the society sees itself. So I have a few slides for you all uh, to really hopefully drive home my point. Now, I'd like to direct your attention first to this blueprint of a temple. As you can see, you know, it's a fairly small shrine. It's got this interesting sense of rhythm, this interesting sense of symmetry on all of its axes. But how and why really is it assembled in this particular way? Um, if you look at the corners of each tier, so this thing, this thing, you'll see that they're actually a miniature version of this structure here, right? So you can see the same kind of dome shape here, same kind of dome shape here. Similarly, if you look at the axis of symmetry at its center, you'll see that it has these kind of barrel shaped shrines on each tier, which once again is actually this, little module that you see. So essentially, the entire temple at every level is based by, is built by alternating these at the corners and these at the centers, right? So the effect that you get from repeating these architectural modules is a sense of emanation, uh, the sense of rhythmic repetition, where really the, the weight of the of the spire here cascades down along the axis of symmetry in, bo in both the uh, cardinal directions and along the diagonal directions here, right? So why was it that these people are building their temples in this particular way? It's tied into how they see their gods and how they see creation itself. Um, in their mythology, creation is something that originates from a single point in space, the nucleus of all creation, the Hiranyagarbha, which then emanates rhythmically into expanding into all of creation. And that's really what's happening here as well, where you have a single point, if you look at it from above, you have a single point that gradually and rhythmically kind of expands. Uh, and to kind of see it as something that's um, arising, you know, this weight that is arising and then overflowing almost like a fountain. Um, at least when I first read it, it really transformed the way I see these temples because it shows you there's all these subtle meanings that we can only reconstruct from looking at literature and mythology. And there's all these, these meanings that would have been obvious to the people who made them that to us are pretty much obscure. 
Um, I'm just going to like take a little bit of a detour here because I personally find Deccan architecture very interesting. It's a very big part of my book. Um, because as I said, architecture is a social fact. You can't understand a society if you don't understand its architecture. Um, if you look at these two shrines here, you'll see that there's this, um, it's basically composed of this barrel shaped, vault, barrel vaulted structure that you see here. Yeah, so here's the barrel vaulted structure. And then what they've done is they've taken it from, if you look at it from this side, right? You can see that it looks more like a horseshoe shaped thing. And that's actually what they've inserted here. So you have the barrel shaped thing and into the center of that, they have rotated the barrel shaped thing and put it in here, if that makes sense. And then what they've done here is, there's a barrel shaped thing, into the center of that is another barrel shaped thing and into the center of that is once again a rotated barrel shaped thing. So what you get really again from this repetition of these architectural modules is a sense of projection and emanation rhythmically out into space. Um, and is, if you actually look at this continuum of Deccan temples, so this is a temple that Pulakeshin II actually built. And if you look at it, it's actually not that decorated with architecture. So you, can, you, get a, you get a sense of this repetition that's, that's there if you look at the sides, but really the architectural modules aren't very well formed. They don't really pop out of the structure itself. Now, if you were to look at this temple from the 11th century, every single corner, every single ledge is decorated with architecture. The single sentence that summarizes uh, medieval Deccan architecture to me is that it's architecture decorated with architecture, uh, which is just, it's such a unique kind of design vocabulary these people are using. And rather than looking at a temple as, you know, just a temple, you can really see that most Deccan temples fit into this grand continuum where they originate into these very simple shrines and then gradually they start projecting along the axis of symmetry and layering these architectural components and they grow iteratively over the centuries more and more complex up to the point where they realize that look, if we keep layering elements, it's going to lose all its geometric cohesion. So instead of having a square plan from which other squares are projecting, let's have squares rotated around other squares, which gives you this beautiful kind of star-shaped design. So any of you who've been to Belur or Halibidu would know what the logical conclusion of that is, these beautiful star-shaped temples. So every one of these structures lies on this great kind of historical continuum. Yeah, I, so they're obviously experimenting and learning uh, with every generation and finding new vocabularies. and. Uh, and obviously, like you said, the, the meanings are, are lost to us, you know, until we integrate this with our understanding of mythology and so on. Uh, what about the politics of it? Uh, when the monarchs commissioned these temples, what did they think they were doing? Um, again, it's difficult to say for sure, yep. because these monarchs haven't left us journals where they wrote, Dear Diary Today, my elephant Stampy trampled on 100 people. Um, but we can make some guesses if you were to look at their land grants, which describe the campaigns that they undertook. And to me, Chalukya temples are especially fascinating because um, of the multiplicity of architectural styles that you see in them. Um, so if any of you have been to Patadakal, uh, you would have seen that the temples there aren't just your typical South Indian looking temple which is made of like these tiered spires, right? You see some that have these long curvilinear towers. Um, and these that's a style that comes from North India, but why is it so important for the Chalukya to have this North Indian style? Because in the early uh, 8th century, they raided North India. Uh, they actually made an attack into the Gangetic Plains. So to build a temple with a kind of Gangetic spire is to establish through architecture that, look, we are so multicultural. We have seen the world, we have taken the style from up north and we have brought it here to our homeland. And this applies not just to architecture, but to sculpture as well. Um, very interestingly, the Chalukya imperial title and also their imperial standard is a boar or Varaha. And this identification of Varaha, uh, this incarnation of Vishnu with kingship, originates in the Gangetic Plains in the Gupta Empire of the 4th and 5th centuries. Um, and there are shrines that the Guptas made in Madhya Pradesh, um, which makes it pretty clear that the Gupta Emperor was seen almost as Varaha on earth. And the Chalukyas take this idea, if any of you have been to Badami, uh, you'd see there's this beautiful, you can actually see it to this day, there's a beautiful sculpture of Varaha with its with the blue paint still on it. And the Chalukya imperial title was Shri Prithivi Vallabha, 
which means uh, fortune's favorite and earth's beloved or you know the beloved of shri and prithvi uh, or lakshmi and bhudevi who are the wives of vishnu uh, so what the chalukyas are really claiming through commissioning all these varaha sculptures is probably that they consider themselves to be earthly manifestations of vishnu himself and just as vishnu had the divine right to redistribute land because he is a, he is the husband and the steward of the earth so to are the chalukya kings and there's many more examples of that uh, which i go into in more detail in my book but i'll just leave you with one um if any of you have been to mahabalipuram uh, and if you have seen uh, the great penance or the descent of the ganges sculpture you'll see that the the depiction of ganga of of shiva there where he's kind of holding out his hand and standing vertically you will see the exact same image replicated in chalukya monuments of the mid 8th century why because the chalukyas fought with the pallavas and defeated them and what they're trying to show by taking the very same depiction of shiva and putting it in their temple is that the pallavas claimed that shiva you no know, favored them but we've defeated them on the battlefield and therefore the very same image of shiva who is associated with pallava kingship is now ours he favors us we have won the god's favor through war so war religion politics architecture art are all very fundamentally intertwined in medieval india but i don't know why that's to to a lot of us that might be surprising but think about art and politics and war and religion today they're all in tech they're all intertwined they're all fundamental to how we navigate our world why do we assume that people of the medieval world were any different absolutely um uh, and uh, you know so this is one uh, sort of evolution of architecture that you've talked about uh, but there's some you know one dynasty extraordinary uh, dynasty ruling dynasty from that period we haven't talked about other rashtrakutas uh, can you just talk to us a little bit about where they originate and also from there uh, i i really want to get into as fast as possible kailashnatha because uh, i i think that of all of these uh great examples of architecture from that time you probably love kalashnatha the most yeah. and so i just want to hear you tell us about that um so i'll just keep the political side of it quick um the rashtrakutas are a vassal of the chalukyas who are located in the upper reaches of the narmada river valley and in the mid 8th century they managed to conquer much of the godavari river valley which is a very agri- an agriculturally productive region and they use its resources to overpower and overthrow the chalukyas when they do this they decide to create a grand religious imperial monument um and that is the kailashnatha temple at elora um, i hope a few of you have been there perhaps um and to me it's it's a truly extraordinary monument because um it's about 4 fifths the height of the leaning tower of pisa it's situated in a in this enormous open space the size of a football field and it's all carved from a single rock this in this enormous cliff face the rashtrakutas removed 2 million cubic feet of rock leaving behind this enormous uh, three four tiered south indian temple which is in fact the farthest north that any south indian temple design has ever appeared um and they do this in the space of 20 years um and you if you look at it if you look at the sheer size of it and you think about how there was no room for error through all those 20 years as they were carving downwards right you can't replace rock into a cliff once you've removed it to think of the logistical sophistication of this polity you need an army of blacksmiths an army of cooks to keep the sculptors fed an army of laborers to remove all the rock an army of elephants and bullock carts just to remove all the debris in addition to masters of of sculpture and architecture who are all working together to make this structure um it just blows me away because um and also i mean keep in mind something that large four fifths the height of the leaning tower of pisa probably one of the largest or probably the largest structure in india at the time and probably one of the largest structure made by human hands in the world at the time and yet most of us may not even have heard of it or even visited it and outside of india the temple is totally unknown um it is just one of those things that the medieval deccan just creates and that has enormous resonance within the medieval deccan and within the medieval world but is now totally forgotten to us today in this very delhi and north india centric imagination of 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 the history of india yeah uh, you do in your introduction uh you know you point out that uh it's not just uh, the greatest monolith of its kind but also perhaps something that will never be equaled again in human history 
uh, and you, you're onto something there because uh, you know uh, when I when I saw Kailashnatha in my own very inexpert opinion, I, I felt that uh, one mind had conceived this and executed it. Now we obviously don't know who that person is. I wish we did, uh, but you do see, get a sense that uh, this has been directed by someone very consciously, uh, who knew exactly what they were doing, uh, who knew, uh, who understood even you know such simple things as what you know how the rocks in, of that area worked and how you would keep you know have have a stable structure. Uh, I would, uh, you know, but you no, know, obviously we, we don't know who who built this. But I, I, I just want, uh, I, I think we'd love to hear how you describe uh, the building of the Kailashnatha. Uh, so once again, Lekha, on to you. In the year 792, the Rashtrakuta imperial family may have held a festival at the Krishneshwara. The monumental temple, by now finished was oriented almost perfectly to the west. Anyone standing in front of it in the darkness of the early morning saw the sun rise from behind the magnificent black cliffs like the temple's halo, ascending to a great din of clanging bells and throbbing drums. Soon, crowds may have started to appear thronging into the dozens of cave temples at Elora, staring at the murals, silently praying, giving gifts to their gods, asking for blessings. As the sun climbed higher, Elora's cliffs may have grown noisier and noisier. In the rowdy dirt arenas, animals fought and wrestlers wrangled as bets were made and audiences cheered. There could have been plays, dances and musical performances as well. Princes and ministers wearing patta fillets and coronets came with their retinues, preceded by the Panchamaha Shabdas, the five great instruments, the horn, conch, drum, victory bell, and something called a tammata, whose meaning is unclear. These were granted exclusively to the highest ranks of the Rashtrakuta imperial network, and were loudly sounded to warn the crowds to stay out of the way of these lords of the great houses. If they were important enough, they would have had a small colored parasol of their own, and perhaps one or two attendants with a chauri, a fly whisk made of a yak's tail. Sometime during the day, the emperor Dhruva himself may have put in an appearance in the company of vassal kings, ministers, chamberlains, and attendants. His splendor eclipsed all his subordinates, making him out as many times wealthier and more prominent. Dhruva might have looked in many ways like the classical Indian king we imagine. In other ways, he certainly was not. Above his head was held aloft a huge parasol of white silk adorned with gold and precious gems. On his head was a tall, heavy gold crown, perhaps encrusted with rubies and carved with fantastic creatures. His chest was covered with thick necklaces of pearls, gold, jewels, and fragrant garlands of rare flowers. His mouth was probably red with exotic beetle. Behind him was a crowd of gorgeous female attendants in the finest of clothes, fanning him with chauris fluttering around his shoulders like birds. Sheila Mahadevi may have been present, attended by the wives of Dhruva's vassals and her sons, the heirs, attended by the sons of Dhruva's vassals. The nameless Thapati, his head covered with a turban and fillets of honor, was in all likelihood also part of this parade. All these people were probably resplendent in festive finery with elaborate garlands and coiffures and makeup. The crowds must have cheered, clapped, and gawked at the procession, drinking in the sight of the tall, well-fed men and women, the handful of elite, sophisticated, ruthless families that rule them now and would do so for generations after. They must have almost seemed to have descended, descended from a heavenly world, 
perfumed water sprinkled before them, fans waving, music playing, and women dancing before their splendid parade in the sweltering heat. Though the masses were unlikely to have been allowed into the priceless Krishneshwara, worth hundreds of millions of dollars in today's currency, Dhruva's retinue was welcomed obsequiously into its hallowed portal. They would immediately have been struck by the remarkable experience, the tangible presence of divinity that the nameless Thapati's design unfolded before their eyes. The Krishneshwara temple is thus not only a political or artistic achievement, it is an invaluable historical artifact which could tell us a great deal about the evolution of Shaivism and Indian religions in the Deccan. It challenges our stereotype of unchanging Indian rituals and myths with a history where priests, kings, and communities instead actively participated in making and remaking them. Moving away from this gallery, Perhaps Dhruva's retinue next climbed up the stairs into the main hall, seeing its murals illuminated by flickering oil lamps as gold leaf and semi-precious stones glittered in the dark. And there, in the heart of the temple, in a cell blazing with light, was the splendid manifestation of Shiva Krishneshwara himself. A linga decked with rubies, gold, and all other precious things. The victorious Dhruva must have heaped it with jewels and prostrated himself to the chanting priests and clanging of bells, decorated, decorating with bloody spoils of war, this representation of the awesome power of human creativity and determination. At sunset, an observer on the other side of Ilapura's cliffs could have watched the sun's red glow vanish behind the cliffs to the west, only to be replaced by the faint glow of the temple's lamps, as if the sun had descended of its own accord. Day and night, it blazed like the subcontinent's crown jewel, billowing smoke and incense courtyard sprinkled with pure scented water, a heady, intoxicating, overwhelming religious experience. According to later inscriptions, gods flying above it stopped to stare in astonishment and concluded that a creation of such beauty could not have been the artifice of mere human hands, but was a self-generated manifestation of Shiva himself. What remains now of Krishna and Dhruva Rashtrakuta, except the dry testimonies of Prashasti propaganda that leave no trace of their humanity and complexity? What remains of their conquests, of their boasts, of their politics and their betrayals? What, where is the immortality and glory they were supposed to have earned by killing thousands? And, but what, the nameless Thapati created, that will stand till the end of time. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, the nameless Thapati. Uh, you know, uh, one thing that really strikes me from this, uh, again, extraordinary dis uh, description that you provide is the way the elites lived uh, and, and how extraordinary that must have been for everyone else. Uh, now, obviously, a lot of this was extractive, right? So they were extracting, uh, you know, from agricultural uh, uh, produce, they were looting uh, from warfare. Uh, but there were, there, there were other forms of economic productivity. You know, when, when we talk about the Deccan, uh, we have to talk about the seas. And uh, these were not, uh, you know, these isolated uh, parochial polities uh, sitting in a corner somewhere, right? So they had, uh, they were trading actively. Uh, can you talk to us about, you know, how they traded and what they traded? Uh, you know, you do sometimes hear of, uh, you know, shipwrecks uh, that provide us extraordinary evidence. Uh, you know, they, they obviously had ports, they had uh, fascinating trading, trading communities. Can you just walk us through how all of that worked? 
for sure um let me first just thank lekha for her two fantastic readings absolutely um as an author you know it's always it's always surreal to see how others receive your work and um the way that lekha has read them like i, I was just like transported uh, i don't know but you all were time i'm i'm profoundly grateful thank you so much lekha for doing that um so yes yeah, so let's, let's talk about trade right so i feel like there's a tendency to think about stuff like globalization as very much a feature of the modern world um but we have evidence all the way back to the bronze age from around 3200 bc that almost from the inception of urban human civilizations globalization was an integral to the way that we conduct ourselves um to show that you are connected to a wider world to show that you are taking influences from across a uh, vast land masses and that you're importing these luxury materials from thousands of kilometers away was integral to showing that you are a person of means and sophistication um and the people of the medieval deccan were no different um the motivations for indulging in trade were very similar to our own motivations today in the sense that the fact that all of us are wearing jeans for example uh, shows that we are a part of of a highly cosmopolitan global elite uh, the same applied also to various aspects of the medieval world um a few examples that you can actually see, you can actually see on the slides above you um if you look at the coin that you see on the right uh, this is of the rashtrakuta emperor govinda the 3rd who was the son of dhruva who was being talked about uh, in the excerpt that lekha read and um you can see there's a few things that are interesting to me at least one of the most interesting aspects of it is that the the ring of text that you see around the gentleman sitting on a horse who is govinda uh, is actually inspired by arabic script it doesn't really say anything it just got those apparently the rashtrakuta saw these funky geometric uh, arabic letters and were like these are pretty you know let's kind of use them on these little mobile pieces of pro- portable propaganda which is what a coin was um but the coin also says a couple of interesting things uh it declares govinda the third to be apratihata which means invincible uh, and of course it depicts him riding a horse um all of you will know of course that the horse is not an animal that um that that grows in large numbers in india right it's something that has always been imported through time so for govinda to be depicting a horse on a gold coin which was used for trade uh, and declaring himself to be invincible is telling you that this man perceives himself as deriving power military power from importing this animal from the arab world which is why he's using this arabic pseudo arabic script um and we have many examples really of the rashtrakutas engaging with the arabs in this way um we have a interesting inscription by a gentleman called uh, madhumati uh, who is the son of a gentleman called sahi arahara and madhumati was the governor of a port called sanjan in southern gujarat um to me it's fascinating because madhumati son of sahi arahara is obviously a sanskrit uh, translation of muhammad ibn shahriyar uh, so this is probably a persian gentleman who had settled down in in the in this region and uh, you can actually see i've excerpted a few elements of his uh, eulogy that you see in his land grants and he there it describes himself very much like a medieval indian king would as somebody who had conquered the rival chiefs and also as somebody who had made of like land grants for offerings to the goddess durga uh, and for building a temple straight arranging a ferry and for feeding pilgrims so it's very obvious that just as the rashtrakutas are participating in the broader cosmopolitan world so too is mohammed ibn, ibn shahriyar and there's so many other examples of this aditya mentioned a sh- uh, shipwrecks for example um there's a very fascinating one discovered i think in the late 2000s uh off the coast of indonesia it's called the belitung shipwreck uh and it contained 60000 ceramic bowls um 60000 is not a small number um they were being exported to uh, the middle east from china and just think a little bit about how do you arrange for 60000 bowls to be produced and shipped across such a vast geographical extent the 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 people who are making these bowls in china were use were doing it using something akin to a modern day production line um where somebody would be working the clay somebody would be putting it onto a into a into a mold somebody would be firing it somebody would be putting the enamel somebody would be painting it and the designs that they were painting are the kind of designs of foliage uh, and geometric motifs that we know were preferred by middle eastern buyers in the 8th century 
So there was some group of people who are transmitting this information to China, realize that China can make these bowls in vast quantities, and there's a demand for particular kinds of designs in the Middle East, and they're commissioning that. They're also arranging the capital for these bowls to be made, right? So there's these financial networks that are spanning continents, and there's logistical networks, because these bowls were not made in a Chinese port. They were made in inland China, packed, sent down river to be put into a ship, and the ship crew was also very multicultural. We know this because of other artifacts found in the shipwreck, uh, which include stuff like a child's toy, or an, and a golden bracelet that was repaired, and an inkwell, or an inkstone, which would have been dissolved in water and used to write a letter. Um, so what were these objects to the people who were riding in that ship? A child's toy, perhaps a gift for somebody's kid that he never got to see. Um, an, ink, an ink stone for a diplomat who was perhaps traveling along this expedition, uh, a, a mended ankle, ankle ring, perhaps for somebody's beloved who never got to see them again. These are all things that the, this emotional world that these people have lived in, and also the globalized world that they lived in, is so similar to ours in so many ways. And it is all the more striking to me that this is also a world of temples. It's a world of wars between these kings wearing jewelry and chewing beetle. Um, and somehow we don't think of Indian kings as participating in such a globalized world. But hopefully, as I've shown you, the evidence that they were part of it and they considered themselves part of the globalized world is pretty incontrovertible. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Uh, and uh, I want to understand, uh, do we get a sense of what role uh, the Deccan polities were playing in this international trade? Uh, and you know, f for example, who were they trading with in the Western Indian Ocean? I think Daya might have the answer to that. <laughs> Indians also exported perfumes, cloves, nutmeg, pepper, maize, and cardamom alongside the odd peacock, rhinoceros, or even elephant for particularly rich menageries in Baghdad. Arabs are recorded to have been aware of thousands of such commodities, which poured into the expensive kitchens and fashionable salons of Baghdad. In the high stakes world of Abbasid politics, Indian poisons, swords, and jewelry were well regarded. So too was Indian knowledge. The Abbasids brought together scholars and texts from the East and the West to develop their understanding of philosophy, spiritualism, cosmology, geography, geology, history, botany, mineralogy, physics, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, medicine, pharmacology, anatomy, optics, agriculture, irrigation, zoology. <laughs> Indian mathematici uh, mathematicians, physicians, and philosophers lived in Baghdad and some were employed in the courts of the Abbasid caliphs Al-Mansur and Harun al-Rashid, contemporaries of the early Rashtrakutas. Indian scholars are attested to have worked alongside Abbasid scholars in the great library known as the House of Wisdom. And Indian numerals, arithmetic, geometry, and natural philosophy had a profound impact on the development of the sciences in the Islamic world. Though the evidence is extremely fragmentary, there are some suggestions in Rashtrakuta texts that the Abbasid innovations, especially in the realm of fine technology, producing sophisticated mechanical devices such as water clocks, fountains, and automata, were reaching the Deccan even as Indian knowledge moved west. At a more intimate level, there is evidence that some Arab merchants were so enamored with India that they're recorded to have named their daughters Hinda. Caches of letters from the period reveal not just good professional relationships between Indians and their Indian, uh, Indian Ocean business partners, but strikingly human tales of friendship, greed, adventure, loss, and sorrow of parting. A story from medieval Kerala describes merchants from 
Karnataka, Malva, Gujarat, Andhra, Odisha, Greece, China, and Arabia, sitting on black carpets, counting money and chatting. A senior merchant among them tried to impress his juniors in a bragging tone. If I sell a Arab horse in the Chola, Tamil country, I will immediately get 2,000 coins in cash. For my elephant, I will get 8,000. If I go to Kolam and Kolapuram, I can sell quickly all the good Karpuram. Evidently, as the historian Ranbi Chakravarti points out, the merchant is attempting to impress his audience with the fact that he is trading in high-value commodities, the only buyers of which would have been uh, land-owning military elites and religious institutions. This is no common merchant, it seems. He then continues his boast in a telling revelation of the closeness of mercantile and political interests in early medieval India. I have to get a hundred thousand coins by way of interest on the loan I have given to Vallabha. Meanwhile, as the ports of the West Coast buzzed with activity, some particularly enterprising Arabs seeking to write travelogues and on the hunt for commercial opportunity, entered the Deccan, reaching the Rashtrakuta heartland itself. Their writings portray India as a strange land of great splendor and prosperity. Such depictions were intended to instill wonder among their readers. A major concern in Arabic poetics, rather than being factual representation of travels. Nevertheless, it is, to, it is fair to say that India's wonders were an important component of Arab travel literature and a crucial part of their imagination of the world. One Arab writer was particularly taken by the ascetics who wandered the jungles and peaks of the Western Ghats. Some of them went about naked with the ring on their penises to prevent all sexual relationships with women, while others wore leopard skins. With their matted hair, wild eyes, and pungent odor, they must have made quite an impression. One of them stood facing the sun somewhere in the Konkan, where, their, where this Arab traveler first saw him. He was apparently still there 16 years later when the Arab visited again, and was stupefied stupefied by the man's discipline and by the fact that his eyes had apparently not been burned into empty husks all over these years. The Rashtrakuta capital, Manyaketa, was also fertile, fertile ground for Arab travelers' imaginations. Manyaketa, now a, a hub of subcontinent spanning political and economic networks, may have rivaled Baghdad itself. Through the 9th century, as the Rashtrakuta imperial net, uh, network and the merchants uh, it patronized flourished, the city seems to have been remade through the profits of war and trade. Indeed, inscriptions often claim that Amogha Varsha made the city. In the absence of major military adventures during his reign, this may have read as a hint of the wealth that global trade brought to the Rashtrakutas, decked with temples markets and mansions surrounded by rivers on three sides, Manyaketa had a great moat and rampart fluttering with a Pali Dhwaja of the imperial dynasty and banners of its most powerful lords, its gods and its guilds. One Arab visitor, clearly awed by what he saw and seeking to impress a cosmopolitan audience in Iraq, wrote, 
In that city, there are, for the ordinary people, one million elephants which carry the merchandise. In this temple, there are about 20,000 idols made of a variety of precious metals and various carved stones mounted with shaped and artistically worked precious jewels. In that house is an idol whose height is 12 cubits and is placed on a throne of gold in the center of a golden cupola. The whole of which is set with jewels like white pearl, ruby, sapphire, blue, and an emerald stone. Amogavasha Rashtrakuta, Vallabha of the Deccan, had it seems made a wise choice in relying on trade rather than the tribute and ceaseless uh, warfare used by his predecessors to fund their politi political military ma machines. As his coffers swelled, the sophisticated young emperor finally had the resources for a different kind of magnum opus than we have seen up to this point. After the setbacks he had faced early in his reign, due to his inability to personally command and motivate his armies, Amogavarsha had developed a flair for diplomacy and politics, an eye for talent, and a knack for promoting and inculcating loyalty. A master of literature and aesthetics, he now brought together an unprecedented concentration of poets and teachers to decorate his court at Manyaketa. He could have merely set them to the banal task of composing prashastis and dramas, but Amogavasha did something else of exceptional vision that would echo down to the very language, languages that Indians speak today. Thank you so much, Dhruva. Okay, um, I want to uh, get into, uh, I want to get into what we just touched upon just now, which is language. Um, because um, Amogavarsha is seen as this patron of, of Kannada. And, uh, uh, you know, ever since we've had linguistic states, uh, we, we tend to think of these almost in the sense of, uh, you know, 19th century uh, European national histories, uh, you know, uh, as these being, for example, uh, Kannada polities and, you know, the Choras of Pandyas being Tamil polities and so on. Uh, and that actually is, is in contrast to everything that we've also just heard uh, about, uh, you know, how cosmopolitan they were. Uh, can you tell us uh, how language worked uh, and how did, did Am Amoga Varsha think of himself as a patron of the Kannada language? And how did he see, how did he see its connection with the other languages of the Deccan? So uh, to give you all a bit of context, Amoga Varsha is a medieval Deccan king who is actually the son of the gentleman on the coin there, Govinda III. And um, to me, he's a particularly interesting character because he comes to the throne at the age of 14 and he retains some form of political power until 868 or I think 878, at which point he dies. Um, and it's a, the history of the ninth century in India is very much a Mogavasha story. Um, you really got to imagine, you know, the guy is crowned at the age of 14 after his father's untimely death. Uh, at some point in his, you know, his early career, and I actually talk about this in some detail in my book, he would have been sitting in front of this great sacrificial fire, you know, undergoing the, the, the ablution, the royal ablution, to transform himself from a prince into a king. Uh, at the age of 14, he would have been surrounded by courtiers and relatives and vassals who wanted nothing more than to kill him or overthrow him. Uh, his eyes would probably have been smarting with the smoke of the sacrificial fire. His head would have been pounding from all the chanting and the beating of drums. And like most 14 year olds, he fails miserably <laughs> at his very first attempt to rule. Um, but he comes back. He comes back and he seizes the throne once again in 21 and then rules it for almost 40 years. Um, if you look at the list of the longest reigning, lo longest reigning rulers on Wikipedia, Amogavarsha is nowhere to be found. But he's a profoundly, profoundly influential person, um, partially because, as they added in his excellent reading, uh, Amogavarsha patronized trade. He encouraged trade. Uh, in fact, he's probably the first attested Deccan emperor to have gone out of his way to kind of uh, appoint Arabs as governors of his ports. But he also patronized Kannada poetry. Uh, this has led to him very often being described as, you know, the father of Kannada literature and that kind of thing. 
um but realistically speaking we have evidence that kanada was spoken for many many centuries before amogavarsha what amogavarsha does is that he formulates uh, an aesthetic theory from his extensive experience with understanding speaking sanskrit appreciating sanskrit drama poetry aesthetics and using really the linguistic tools developed in the sanskrit speaking world he applies them to kanada and he systematizes the language he does his extensive survey of its various dialects and he puts it into one manual called the kaviraja margam or the way of the king of poets and this becomes the standard courtly register the sophisticated register of kannada that is spoken for many many centuries after that um he as i said he's very often portrayed as originating the kannada language being the father of the kannada language but how would his contemporaries have seen him right um imagine somebody who is speaking in uh, english or in tinglish declaring that you know they are understanding the language is superior to that of telugu or that of hindi right um there would have been complexities in how this man was seen as on time but today he is seen only as a unitary figure that is very well suited to these unitary uh, regional and linguistic nationalist narratives um in terms of how language itself was used in in the medieval deccan um it's very often language associated with power um for a king to choose to say something in sanskrit as opposed to kannada probably meant that he was writing it for a different kind of audience uh, because audiences that understood sanskrit were few and far between and usually elites um whereas those who understood kannada even if it was a courtly register of kannada would have been far more uh, far more common place um after amogavasha writes his kaviraja margam the proportion of sanskrit in in land grants in the deccan goes from 85% to 15% over the course of about 150 years um so obviously he was doing something that the elites of karnataka enjoyed uh, and once again like given that the traces that survive of the medieval period are all made by elites we have no idea what the common people thought of all this all we know is that elites loved the idea of speaking this new sophisticated sanskritized register of their language um and we see similar dynamics with other languages as well uh, if you look at maharashtra uh, like marathi for example it originates from maharashtri prakrit uh, which was initially not really patronized by the dynasties that ruled in the region because they were vassals of the chalukyas and the rashtrakutas and these vassals preferred to kind of speak the language of the imperial court which was kannada or sanskrit and but then gradually over the centuries as the as the control and the power of the imperial center weakens they become more interested in expressing themselves to their local vassals and therefore begin to patronize marathi literature right so it's it's really a spectrum uh, in terms of how language is used in the medieval world and it's never this kings didn't have this modern sense that they must patronize a language and make contributions to it and save it from extinction to them it was about power it was about what is politically useful it just so happened that that political utility lines up very well with our modern political ideas but let's not project these modern notions onto these people yeah you know the idea that language uh, can confer power or can be used to uh, expand your own power is obviously uh, something that we understand in our own time uh, you know speaking of power and before we get to daya's uh, fourth uh, reading right now uh, I, I, can you just talk to us about uh, you know uh, we 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 do often have this sense in india that uh, the early medieval period was not all that violent and uh, we of course know from your book that that is not true uh, how did power work and how how often was that expressed in violent ways um always um from the very beginning of human history violence and political power have always gone hand in hand um the notion we have today that violence was something that was introduced by um you know central asian invaders is not based on historical fact um in fact the overwhelming amount of evidence that we have from medieval india before the arrival of islam and turks is that these were profoundly violent polities if you read any land grant from the period you will have these most extremely graphic and almost horrifying uh descriptions of you know elephants whose trunks have been lopped off uh men whose bellies have been pierced by spears gouting blood 
and the ability of the king to inflict this kind of violence upon his enemies uh, and also to show mercy to those who submitted to him was integral to their conception of themselves as merciful monarchs who are saving the people and reordering the world just as in bygone times the gods once did um it's to me at least it's almost terrifying because very often i'm asked if you could go back and meet a medieval king who would you go back and meet and how would my answer was always i would not want to meet a medieval king at all i would i would absolutely i would have been you know how his hero set his pet elephant upon me in 5 minutes of meeting me um these are people of who are extremely cultured extremely sophisticated who have a very strong conviction of themselves as saviors and as people who have the right to use violence to uh, inflict this order upon the world and very often this is a violence in which their own personal ambitions and vendettas are intertwined especially um towards from from towards like the 9th 10th century onwards uh, there's a violence that increasingly comes to be inflicted upon the enemy's women um so for a king to capture his rivals uh, harem um and to include them in his court and to force them to pay attendance to him uh, was a sign of superiority and of and actually of being manlier in a sense than his rival was um so medieval indian kings conception of um virility of power of the favor of the gods and the ability to reorder the world was tied in to their ability to inflict violence against all kinds of populations except for of course those who submitted to their overwhelming power yeah so uh, mercy would come from submission uh, yeah you know uh, i think we should move to daya because uh, the you know uh, we're going to talk about uh, the siege of a city which is is a topic that's horrifyingly topical at the moment uh, so over to you there just for context that is going to be talking about the sacking of the great city of manikata that we just so arabs describing in such glowing terms <clears throat> krishna the third's title ganda martanda aditya sun among sun like warriors was a compound of kannada and sanskrit only allowed by the grammarians Uh, following the lead established by his ancestor Amoga Amoga Varsha the 1st in royal titles such as this by his death in 967 it seemed that no other king had ever been the overlord of subcontinent's entire southern peninsula as completely as Krishna the 3rd Rashtrakuta and yet in 972 five years after his death the great cap- rashtrakuta capital of manyaketa which had awed south indian kings and arab travelers for nearly two centuries and sent out armies to ravage much of the subcontinent was sacked for the first time on the banks of the narmada at the fort called kali ghatta near modern talghat three and a half centuries after the chalukya vallabha publication the second had humbled harsha lord of the north on the same shores a new harsha faced the enemies of the deccan he was called siyaka harsha parmar king of malwa in madhya pradesh of a dynasty of military aristocrats once subservient to the pratiharas of northern india the warlords of the deccan had sacked his capital at ujjain barely a decade earlier and forced him to prostrate before krishna the 3rd now that krishna was dead succeeded by his elderly and incompetent brother siyaka's time had come at kali ghatta the rashtrakuta armies tried to hold off siyaka's bands of boat riding troops killing one of his generals and in uh, killing one of his generals in hails of javelins and flaming projectiles but the parmar king coming up with reinforce reinforcements outmaneuvered the deccans deccanese and inflicted a devastating defeat on them this defeat would slowly snowball into one of the most unprecedented military disasters in the subcontinent's entire history a man 
bearing the title of Harsha, had finally crossed the Narmada and entered the Deccan. The subcontinent must have reeled in shock as news of the disaster began to spread. As we have seen, the 10th century had been one of war and tumult in North northern India as the Palas and Pratiharas declined and new regional kingdoms emerged. Now, chaos was coming to the Deccan as well. Perhaps the Malvans rushed through the gates like a river through a broken, embank uh, river through a broken embankment, pouring down the Royal Avenue. They stormed past whitewashed mansions with balconies and terraces from where aristocrats had watched parades. They saw the splendid elephant racecourses of the city where the Rashtrakuta emperors, preceded by troops of dancers, came to enjoy the cinnamon scent of the Tuskers' must, the cheers of their subjects. Perhaps they paused before sacking dozens of temples that decorated Manyaketa. What would they have thought of the beautiful, tiered southern architecture unfamiliar to their eyes? Everywhere, like other armies across the medieval world, and as implied by Indian trans inscriptions, they probably ran about in gangs in the neighborhoods, slaughtering, raping, plundering. They may have pried out the gold panels, made piles of loot out of family heirlooms, and assaulted their captives, gloating over their power. Do not the hand devoid of wristlets, the breast devoid of necklace, the eyes deprived of kajal, of the wives of his enemies, bespeak the heroism, the overpowering capacity, and the prosperity of the king, asks a medieval Deccan poet, offering us an insight into the attitudes of the warlike aristocrats of the period. It must have been surreal for King uh, Siyaka Parmar to enter the imperial palace, outside whose gates crowds of vassal lords had once gathered to the beat of the Rashtrakuta drum. He strode past its intricate series of courtyards, accompanied by a platoon of guards and senior generals, including his son, Bhakpati Parmar, Lord of Speech, a poet and capable military leader. In those courtyards, Siyaka had once waited in humiliation with other subjugated kings as the Wallaba, Wallaba's officers displayed captured horses and elephants before them, waiting uh, for the palace chamberlains to strike the floor with their golden staves and admit them to the next courtyard and the next. This continued until they finally reached the imperial court where they had to gaze upon their Rashtrakuta overlord with compulsory adoration. And should they be called to do so, touch their crown heads to his feet. Siyaka inspected the offices and sub-offices of the Manyaketa palace and had their records carved on copper plates ceased. What might he have been, what might he have seen as he explored and ransacked the palace? Rashtrakuta literature speaks of exquisite murals and carvings and lush gardens, flowers, waterworks, artificial hillocks, and trees carefully manicured and arranged. There were pleasure pavilions and bathhouses with exquisite fountains and tanks, water-powered automata ingeniously crafted into the shapes of lotuses, animals, and women, hydraulic marbles. Inspired by developments in, uh, they were inspired by developments in Baghdad and Constantinople. Perhaps the Malvan king sat on Amoghavarsha Rashtrakuta's lion throne, gloating at his newfound power and the woe of his vanquished enemies. Within weeks, Ganga troops led by Krishna III's loyal general, Marasimha II, uh, had, 
had chased Siaka out of the Deccan. But it was too late. Fortune had finally abandoned the Rashtrakutas. Though there would still be Rashtrakutas claiming the title of Sri Prithvi Vallabha for years after, however, neither an army nor the, the great capital and its wealthy surrounding territories to support them and enforce their authority over the Deccan's kingdoms, nobody paid them any attention. Thank you so much, Daya. So we really should move to audience questions. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Uh, if you can just come up to the mic over here. You can hear, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have two comments and one question. And the first comment is actually, as far as I know, Amogavarsha didn't write uh, Kaviraj Japanka. It was commissioned it's by. Commissioned it was commissioned by. by him. But Sri Vijay, his poet, Sri says Vijay quite clearly that it was. Actually, it was done under the instructions <laughs> of so the Vallabha. Let us not say Amogavarsha wrote that book because previously we used to say that, but now it has been corrected. Sure, that's not what the book says. Yeah. So, and the second one is uh, there was a comment that. Uh, the North Karnataka portion, I'm talking from the Karnataka perspective, is the dry land. Hmm. And it's only now. It was always a prosperous land. Right. People have fought for Raichur because it's Doab. It was between two rivers and it, it was very rich in agriculture. Yes, yes. That's actually a okay. big part of the So book. considering the present scenario that they are dry lands, it's absolutely not correct. No, you're, you're, that in the sorry, sir, you're, you're incorrect. Let me just pause you there. Yeah. The Raichur Doab was a major conflict zone between the Chalukyas and Rasht and the, and the Cholas in the 11th century. There is not as much evidence of agricultural productivity in the 5th, 6th centuries where the book begins. But that said, the Chalukyas originate in the Malaprabha River Valley, yeah. but they do expand into the Raichur Doab. So, in fact, Vijayanagara period clearly space that is very, very rich in agriculture. That's right. Okay. And South Karnataka was not rich because it was always raining, it was always fever and diseases, and they could not, we could never get any big king from the South Karnataka. It was always the North Karnataka which has ruled this uh, Karnataka land. Okay. And the question which I have is can you please highlight? Uh, uh, the Huyan Song's journey, so during the Amogavarsha period, he comes almost at the same period when Amogavarsha was ruling actually. So, and uh, he talks about Amogavarsha, sorry, uh, Pulakeshi period, okay. So, during the Pulakeshi period, what was his observation actually? So, Huyan Song's observation. So, again, these are all comments and questions Thank are addressed in the book. So, please do read it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so, in terms of, so, Xuan Zhang, as, as the gentleman said, is a Chinese pilgrim who travels through India and he's interested in obtaining Buddhist scriptures to take back to China. And he leaves us with a few very interesting details that, again, you'll see in the first chapter of the book. Um, one of which was that Pulakeshin II was a very brash young man who treated his neighbors with contempt. Um, which, is, which is so interesting. We, we At least, I think that the general tendency in our imagination of these medieval kings is that, you know, they're very devout and polite individuals, but these are people who are extraordinarily rich, militarily powerful, and probably not very pleasant to actually be around. Uh, there's also a lot of other interesting details he gives us about the Chalukya court. Apparently, um, generals of the Chalukyas who were defeated in battle uh, were forced to wear women's clothing and then mocked by the entire court. And because the shame of that humiliation would kill themselves. Um, which is a strange way of keeping armies in line and thankfully even more enlightened times. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in like actually seeing how somebody from outside India saw these medieval Deccan kings, then there's uh, translations of Xuanzang's journeys that are available on archive.org. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, more than a question, it's a request. Because if we look at uh, the stories of the time, there are also a lot of instances of intermarriage for the sake of political gain between the dynasties, the overlords and their vassals, the Nolambas, the Banas, and fratricide, Dhruva, and then uh, Govinda fighting Kamba. So can you tell us a little bit about that as well? These yes. were two very popular things that were themes that were happening at that time. All right. So again, once again, these are addressed in great detail in the book. Um, so please well, buy I'm it. Not, I'm not 
not sure everyone here is going to yes, read it. Yes. So could you so, tell us a bit about it? I'll just to give you like a quick bird's eye overview, right? Um, political marriages were a very big part of how these how kingdoms were ruled. Uh, and they don't just apply to marriages between rival kingdoms, but also to um, marriages within a kingdom as well. Uh, you would very often have a ruling family, you know, marry their sons to the daughters of important vassals, um, thus giving the, the offspring of that marriage a chance at taking the throne eventually. Um, so there's basically, marriage was a mechanism to foster these intergenerational stakes in the success of a polity because a powerful vassal would want to see his grandson on the throne. Right? And these women, very interestingly, you know, though they're very often depicted as little more than hapless, devout damsels, were actually master politicians. I give examples of many medieval queens in my book, including Loka Mahadevi, the queen of the Chalukyas, and of course, uh, in Lekha's reading, she mentioned a Rashtrakuta queen called Sheila Mahadevi. Um, and yes, fratricide was a very big part of it because uh, a king would have sons from many different wives who came from many different families these women would all act as their family's primary lobbyist within the court and with their sons very often being the means through which their political interests were advanced. Um, and very often when a king died, if there was no clear line of succession, then these, the, then their sons would take the field, uh, supported usually by their mother's families. Um, and to me at least, I mean, just really imagine the what, what the lives of these young princes would have been, you know, that from the time of your birth, you rarely see your father uh, your mother, while she might love you, also sees you as a political token. And all of your brothers, you know, your playmates, um, you know that someday they might betray and kill you on the battlefield. Um, and I'm sure that left some psychological scars that you know it's difficult for us to reconstruct. Thank you for that excellent question. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? We have a couple of minutes. Go ahead. So I'm just uh, curious. When you were doing this book, when, when you were preparing for this book, right? And now we've seen the forgotten world as one phrase that you've written. So what's your take personally about the Deccan rulers in India, right? How did it influence you during this journey of writing the book? What has it left? Like you said, it would have scarred them forever. So what's that that's left you inside about your own history? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. I think... The answer to that is it's made me realize just how vast my personal history is. Not that, you know, I'm descended from any of these kings, but rather because I can see that the lives of these kings led as rich and full of detail and violence and betrayal and ambition, all these other things, they were still the 1% or maybe the 0.1% of the ruling elite of this enormous landmass. And to think of the architects, the farmers, the artists, the sculptors, the painters, the carpenters, you know, the fishermen, the butchers, the cobblers, all these people who have left no trace in the historical record and who much more than those kings were our actual ancestors. Um, it really shifts your perspective. It shifts the way you think about who you are and also shifts the perspective in which you understand modern Indian politics because it shows you that this closeness of mercantile, um, military, political, and religious power is nothing new to the subcontinent. It is the, the fundamental vocabulary in which political power is stated and enforced in India. Um, and it just gives you a much vaster sense of who you are that's much more connected to your immediate surroundings because there's only so much that you can derive from reading about uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq leading to hyperinflation in Delhi through using leather coins, right? Reading about these much more proximate examples of people who lived in cities that we might have grown up hearing about, um, really makes you realize just what a grand story it all is and how it's all interwoven, interconnected with all these other peoples, all these other religions who were accustomed to us as thinking of uh, as different from us, but who are really fundamentally the same. So, great question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we will have to wrap up now. Uh, but I, I will just say that... Uh, We've barely scratched the surface of Anirudh's book and there is in fact a lot of ground up history uh, that Anirudh presents. Uh, and uh, thank you to Lekha and Daya for your amazing readings. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you all.